When do we reap the fruits of meditation? How is everybody doing today? I am Thomas and welcome. I do mostly educational videos on my channel and uh, focus on the things that are kind of off the beaten path and things that uh, are, as a researcher, you know, I'm a, I'm a historian by trade and um, I wrote my dissertation on a um, few different groups of uh, uh, jazz musicians in Chicago in the 50s and 60s and they exposed me to a lot of uh, kind of uh, esoteric uh, fields of study that I knew nothing about. And I was already into that stuff in the first place. And so I've kind of just ended up uh, studying a lot of stuff that uh, nobody's ever heard of before. <laughs> um, and I found a lot of gems in there. And so I'm just trying to share some of the, uh, some of the findings that I've made. And uh, because I think that could benefit people, I think it's benefited me. And uh, so I'm just trying to spread it around. And um, one of those things, one of the one of the most powerful ones is uh, the tree of life here. Uh, this is a model of our uh, faculties of consciousness, a uh, map of our faculties of consciousness. And that word faculties, maybe you want to think of that as maybe even like facets or aspects of consciousness, the different, uh, you know, facets or faces or sides or, um, y you know, um, aspects. Just uh, our consciousness is has many different uh, aspects to it. And this is a map of 12 of them. And uh, I think it's a very effective map. Uh, it's just something that you, you use in the back of your head. It's not really uh, a dogma. It's it's really just a, it's a skeleton, and that you use to uh, put your own information on, and so it's it's really like a, an elaborate mnemonic device. And I love it because it's just it's it's really dogma free. It's a bunch of numbers and a bunch of geometrical relations, spatial relationships, and um, you know then you you plug you plug your own stuff into it. And uh, so it's, I guess it's only as good as what, as what you plug into it, but you, you just need to learn kind of the basics and then you can, uh, you know, uh, operate it for yourself. I think that it also is kind of one of the weaknesses of, of some of the esoteric schools, uh, the more secretive schools of a uh, tree of life is they, they imbue it with more doctrine than it really needs, I think. And uh, they make it all secretive, um, where you have to be initiated into everything in order to get the next uh, the next secret. But you know, really, when you use this, it's it's really like a system of theory. It it uh, it produces its own, um, you know, information to put on it just by living your life. If you live your life in with this model in mind, in the back of your mind. Um, you know, you'll be able to, to glean what the spheres really mean. Uh, these are the spheres. This is a, uh, they look like circles, but they're really called spheres. And there are 10 of them. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then there's a thing here called the abyss, which is an implied sphere to make 11. And then there is a zero above the tree to make 12. So that's 12 different faculties of consciousness or facets of consciousness. And um, they basically, you kind of enumerate them like the tenth sphere is uh, our kind of our reptilian ancestry, reptilian brain, where we, uh, it's the state of nature, the law of the jungle, survival of the fittest fight or flight response, uh, the state of health of the body, 
um, you find yourself in the tenth sphere really like, you know, anytime your survival is at stake, uh, which includes, you know, the very beginning of your life. And then, you know, if any time that somebody, you know, plants you into the jungle, uh, you know, then your tenth sphere is going to be, uh, that's where your center, um, you know, attention is going to be located. And then your ninth sphere, uh, just above the 10. And, you know, your emotions are usually kind of here in this junction between 10 and 9. Uh, you know, you have some uh, emotions are really like in the ancient Egyptian, uh, which is, you know, the tree of life uh, came from the Egyptian or came through the Egyptians. They may not have developed it, but they they certainly used it. Uh, some of them, I mean, obviously, um, but uh, they they depict uh, the emotions by different animals, you know, so they have, you know, a jackal or a snake or, you know, these are all um, how we portray emotions with animals. So they're they're part of our animal uh, consciousness. And, but they also link into the, the night sphere through, even though the night sphere is also kind of an animal thing, it's really like our mammalian brain. Um, this is our, um, what, we, uh, what we experience in the first few years of our lives when we're growing up in the home. So this is like our domestic consciousness, the nest. And um, so some of the emotions uh, also bleed into the night sphere. Um, the night sphere also has a lot to do with memory as well. The tenth sphere is kind of like body memory. And the night sphere is, you know, like beginning to be our conceptual memory, our associational memory before that. Um, and uh, whereas the tenth sphere is more like probably more like the amygdala. And uh, so this is um, our heightened state of learning, heightened state of receptivity, where we're in the, in the home in the first years of our lives, we're like a sponge soaking up everything from our environment, but particularly from our caregivers that we imitate. We, we memorize what they do, and then we learn to imitate what they do. So it's blind imitation. You know, we, we imitate them regardless of whether it's good or, or bad. Um, you know, patterns of abuse get imitated, you know, and uh, addictions and bad habits get it imi imitated. So the, this is a, a blind kind of following, but it's a high state of receptivity and uh, the highest kind of potential of learning for us. Now, when we move to the A sphere, we move from really like the domestic sphere in the home out into the public. So this may be as we begin to go to school, you know, we go to church, we go into public as a, you know, um, and start participating in that world out there. Uh, we come in contact with the institutions. And inc incidentally, the institutions uh, are in a constant state of in invading uh, these areas. You know, you can think of it in terms of like talking machines. So the institution and the establishment is here at the A sphere, but they are, uh, the, the A sphere is a deceiver. This is where the trickster is. And uh, the, um, the A sphere is predatory also. So they, they try to absorb the other spheres. It tries to absorb the other spheres. And really, you know, this, the tree has all of the spheres in balance. But if we kind of go out into the real world, we, we, we see how the A sphere has like swollen up so it kind of takes up the whole diagram and the rest of the tree, the rest of the spheres are just like over here in the corner. Um, that's how the A sphere uh, operates in, in modern society. It, it dominates the space. And, um, you, you know, so when you think of the A sphere, you tend to think of domination, the establishment, the experts, the institutions, and a lot of times it has bad connotations, 
but it's not a it's it's not it's still a faculty of consciousness it's really our logic and our belief systems our reasoning uh it, deductive reasoning and um but it's just that the the sphere itself needs to be shrunk down back into its proper perspective or its its proper proportions um it's 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 too big uh in in modern life but they also because they are so predatory so like for example a talking machine like a radio or a television they they can they can invade the domestic space and so even though you're you're not in you're not in public you're still you know getting that um getting that communication from the public even when you're in your own home they've invaded with their you know establishment their consensus worldview and their belief systems even before you're able to defend yourself you're still in this um hyper hyper uh receptive state and um you know you're being hit with uh the state of the art uh communications from uh the the establishment so that uh that's just kind of how you would kind of map out um you know the proliferation of mass media okay then uh so so they teach us what we're supposed to believe and to the extent that we believe it and we jump through their hoops they uh welcome us as a junior member of the a sphere um now for people who who get into the a sphere or who are offered into the a sphere or maybe even just observe it from where they are at the night sphere they uh they can especially if they're you know uh creative or intuitive or left-handed or whatever they um they they might come over here uh because the a sphere is really like the the real world so called and the seventh sphere is the imaginary world so the seventh sphere has to do with our imagination and then also our intuition our um inspiration our pleasure principle how we uh try to uh put together pleasing harmonic harmo uh, harmonious relationships you know we take uh the a sphere divides everything into parts and into different categories the seventh sphere takes those things and puts them together in in pleasing uh harmonious uh configurations um and so they um they see the problems with the a sphere they discern another seventh sphere things discern um the problems with the a sphere and so they come over here and they use their creativity and their uh you know imagination and all their their inspiration and their intuition and they they come up with uh pieces of creativity that attempt to correct some of the problems that are over here the problems that they see that are aggrieving them so these are people who come up with you know different kinds of art um products you know whether it's a song or a book or you know a comedy sketch or whatever and then also um an invention inventions that uh try to correct some of the problems that are over here machines or you know th uh things that are you know not uh not uh are what we would think of as machines but maybe they are um you know uh it inventions that are um intellectual property okay then uh the 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 inspiration of the seventh sphere also sets us up to move further up the tree um to kind of become some of those inspirations um to give back you know your uh, one of the the top uh fractals here is called the stepping stone and uh, the inspiration gives us a stepping stone or a standing shoulder we stand on their shoulders and that enables us to go even further but the inspiration is just 1% and that perspiration is the 99% so we have to work very hard to climb up this pyramid 
uh, to the top here at the sixth sphere, which is where we're normally located. But um, the sixth sphere is our faculty or facet of free will. This is our ability to pay attention to what's going on and to make decisions about what's going on. And so, unfortunately, normally we're paying attention down the tree, down into the consensus worldview and down into the domestic space and even far down into the just uh, survival, living, satisfying your emotions uh, kind of space. So our attention is preoccupied with kind of our comfort zone. This is this is how we grew up. And so we're comfortable in here, even, you know, it's kind of like an abusive um, relationship, even though we're being abused, we're comfortable with it. And so um, we don't, uh, we prefer to be abused than actually to uh, turn around and move into a, a, an unknown situation where we're not comfortable. But at the sixth sphere, we use our decision-making ability to finally decide to turn around and to, and to uh, point our attention in the direction of higher spiritual growth. And then we, uh, which requires a great deal of courage. We have to be able to stand in the face of fear. We have to recognize that when we're scared of something, that doesn't mean that we can't do it. We can still do it even though we're scared. And so that is, that's the major thing that, you know, has to be there here at the sixth sphere. And the sixth sphere is really kind of the major sphere that we're dealing with right now in this in this world and maybe even all the time is that we we need to master our ability you know uh to make decisions not based on our emotions not based on uh what the consensus tells us not based on our belief systems but based on you know reality and and so that that's kind of what the key is is um but the problem is that our kind of our conception of reality is a little bit clouded and and um unoccupied because we haven't really filled in all these upper facets or faculties of consciousness so at least here we can begin to start uh grasping some of that so we start here with the fifth sphere we can pay attention to the fifth sphere from here. And this is uh, really our sense of justice. Um, and this is really the, uh, the source of justice. So this is like our um, cosmologies, our holy books, um, our theories of everything. These are things that we have... Um, spent generations investigating and experimenting upon, experiencing and investigating. And we, uh, over the course of a whole culture or civilization, we have compiled a giant book or some other media that um, attempts to describe all of, of everything like a theory of everything, you know, it's where, you know, who is God? Where does God come from? What is the purpose of the universe? What are humans doing here? How did it, uh, how did all this happen? How do these things all fit together? How do you make sense of everything? Okay. Some of these are better than others. Um, but, um, they, they serve as a kind of a more objective form of, of the natural, what you call the natural law. Whereas this is like the artificial law artifice and uh, decree commandments codes this, these are arbitrary where these are you know based on observation these don't have to be arbitrary but they they can be arbitrary and they tend to be arbitrary so the the natural laws articulated here at the fourth sphere and it is enforced here at the fifth sphere sense of justice, which is also known as karma. Karma as uh, our um, 
as you sow, so shall you reap. Uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, what comes around goes around, you know, boomerang. And so we act here. We can imagine that there's like a mirror here, uh, you know, or that there it's a boomerang, you know, kind of. And so the karma uh, calibrates itself based on waste violence and violation and so if our behavior is wasteful or violent then that's the same uh vibe that we're going to get back to us and so we can gradually learn from our karma oh that was violent i didn't even realize that it was violent until i got the feedback now that I got the feedback, I'm recognizing that maybe my behavior is more violent than I thought it was or more wasteful than I thought it was. And we can gradually fine tune our behavior to eliminate the violence and waste if we, you know, take our karma as a teacher. So uh, this is, you know, this is the way that the six sphere person who they when they turn our, turn their attention around can gradually start to glean uh, some of these higher uh, higher aspects and be able to kind of, um, you know, get ourselves away from uh, the kind of the, the aspects of like, these are, they're holding your hand and they're just telling you what to do. But here we're tuning into uh, a world that is free where we can determine uh, better what our optimal behavior should be. Okay, also with the fourth sphere, uh, we've got uh, our universal love and universal language. Uh, gives to give seeking nothing in return, uh, love unconditionally, love our enemies, and then also, um, you know, being able to tune in to any type of innate communication, uh, nonverbal communication uh, from other sources. Uh, whether that is uh, like a telepathy or a meeting of the minds or um, a nonverbal uh, body language, um, those kind of things uh, in, in uh, inflection. And then also, you know, things like music and uh, math and geometry can also fit in here in a certain way. Okay, then we have our... Um, we have our psychic powers here at the abyss. And this is uh, particularly, uh, it also corresponds to uh, the magnetic uh, force of magnetism. It, all, it totally uh, also represents electricity, but it's, electricity is more of a latent thing in, in, the, in the abyss. And uh, this corresponds to uh, psychic receptivity and psychic heat. So the psychic receptivity is the ability to tune into and recognize omens and synchronicities and other coincidences that happen in our lives and that they, they are an important marker for us. And then the psychic heat is basically the ability to act upon those omens and to you know act in accordance with those omens that we get. Now, there are other aspects here of the uh, abyss such as you know clairvoyance and teleportation and remote viewing and uh, these these things uh, also fit in here at the uh, at the at the abyss at the level of the psychic powers there's somewhat of a distraction on your spiritual path uh, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't use them or open them or learn them but they also uh, they can tend to you know, derail you from your spiritual path because you're able to do some absolutely miraculous things and you begin to think that that is the path when it's actually just kind of a, uh, it, it, you know, it's kind of just a result of, of your spiritual, um, you know, your spiritual journey. And it's not, it's not uh, positive feedback for you. It's not telling you that you're, you know, this is the, you know, you, you people end up, thinking that this is really like the goal 
whether when it's actually just part of the destiny uh the destination or that the that it's part of the journey that it's not the destination but it's the you know it's the journey but we'll talk more about the abyss the abyss is is one of the hardest parts of understanding the whole tree and um you know, different schools have had very different interpretations of how, how it's done. And um, some schools of tree, of tree of Life don't even have an abyss. And they use the lines between the, um, between the spheres as kind of a, a substitute for the abyss. And they call that the uh, uh, tarot. The tarot deck is, the, is kind of the substitute for the abyss. Okay, then we have um, the three, one, two, and three, which are a, really a divine triangle of our uh, most divine faculties or facets within. And so with the third sphere corresponds to omnipotence, all-powerful. The second sphere corresponds to omniscience, all-knowing or wisdom. And the first sphere corresponds to omnipresence, all present at all times within. And so just quickly, you know, we tap into this through sound. We tap into this through light, um, which is really uh, in order to get the get to the light, we have to be able to block out the sound or to ignore the sound. Um, and then, you know, you might even think of this as kind of like breaking the sound barrier. And then uh, the first sphere is really our unifying faculty. So this is like the ether, the ether of the physicist and the, uh, you know, from like the Mickelson Morley experiment where they're saying that there's this underlying medium uh, that, um, you know, pervades all of time and space. And this underlying medium uh, is a unifier because what's at, what's at my deepest center in my heart is the same thing that's at your deepest center. And so we have, we have that in common. So this unifies everyone. But it's only unifying if we can actually, you know, get to that deepest center. So that requires great stillness. And again, the analogy is kind of like a, a body of water. Um, it's only when the body of water is completely calm that you can you can see through to the bottom the water becomes transparent if it's utterly still but until then you see it's opaque okay then the zero above the tree is the mystery uh it's the nothingness and it's uh it's the part of the universe that we don't really have access to so we're not able to really determine what is here we can determine kind of indirectly what's there uh, but the zero is really the part of the uh, the creator that uh, the universe um, that the creator reserves for itself. Part of the universe that the creator reserved for itself, so that we don't we don't know anything about it. Okay, so those that's pretty much uh, the twelve facets or faculties of consciousness. And what I've done with my model is I've taken like the whole tree itself and i've shrunk it down into miniature size and i've applied it to each one of the spheres so uh i've taken each one of the 12 facets or faculties and i've divided them up even further into 12 like sub sub facets um so you have 12 uh, which I refer to as our stage as stages of um, of life, like so s dramatic stages. So twelve different dramas and twelve other dramas here, twelve other dramas here. This, these are 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 places, and so this is a total of one hundred forty four, and these are 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 dramas in that they're they're places where you uh situations and scenarios that you end up in your life where you're being called upon to act in a certain way to can you do this it they're kind of like mini initiations each one of them is a is a 
a situation where uh, you're 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 being tested. Can you do this? Some of them are easy and some of them are hard. Some of them are, are easy for certain people and harder for other people. And in their skills, you 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 acquire the skills so that you're able to negotiate these different situations. And that, to a certain extent, is is initiation. Today, so I have 144 of those, and if you'd like a list of those 144 so that you can use it to refer, refer back and uh, keep score at home as I go through, I'm going through all 144 stages in each, uh, each video is covering one separate stage. So I'm going through each of these and uh, if you'd like a list of those so that you can kind of follow along at home, just click the link in the description and I'll send you a free copy of that. Um, and that way, it, it'll just help you to learn this more quickly because you'll have it right at your fingertips and then you can cross-reference it when you watch any of the episodes. Okay, now today we're going to look at, uh, out of the 144 different ones, we're going to look at number 62. When do we reap the fruits of meditation? And briefly, this is located right here in the fifth sphere, and this is the, the ninth fractal of the fifth sphere. Okay, so the fifth sphere is about our sense of justice, nonviolence, you know, nonviolation, and uh, also um, it has to do with like subculture. Uh, it has to do with, um, uh, I guess you would say that it's a, a type of analysis. So whereas this, the A sphere is separating things out in, into different categories, that the fifth sphere is doing that too, but doing it in terms of uh, the form and the function and the relate interrelationship. So it's separating things out, but it's doing it internally, not the surface characteristics of things, but the form and the function of those things are being separated. And that that's what you would call analysis. Okay, so that is that's the fractal. We're in the fifth sphere. And we're in the ninth fractal of the fifth sphere. So in the ninth sphere is about blind learning, imitation, heightened receptivity. Um, and so those are the factors that are kind of coming into play here for number 62, which is called suspended trance state. Stage number 62 is about an alternate state of consciousness with heightened awareness and focus that can be used for spiritual growth. Suspended trance state. Um, edge of your seat cushion. Lost in the activity. Lost in the flow. Spellbound. Hyper-aware clarity. Riveting absorption. 